Hello gardeners and welcome to another edition of your gardening week. This is the spot to come get your gardening questions answered, hang out with a great gardening community and get yourself established on a great path to becoming a better gardener. If you're new to the channel and if you've been getting benefits from the Gardener Scott videos and just haven't done it yet, be sure to click on the subscribe below and select the bell so you're notified when new videos are coming out and when these live streams are happening. So, Gardener Kevin, what do you think? I got a new mic. I'm always trying to improve the live stream for all of you. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Is the sound the best ever? Because I certainly hope so. I've been working the last couple of days to get the mic set up happening so that we don't have some of the problems we've had in the past. Great to see everybody checking in. I want to go ahead and um, start with a question that uh, Shakti Kurathik, I hope I was even close with that name, was asking about carbon in the soil and how it benefits plants because most people think and know that plants get their carbon from the carbon dioxide in the air. Well, yes, plants get the bulk of their carbon from carbon dioxide in the air. They retain that carbon within their structure. That's what holds plants up. That's what makes the stems. That's what allows the plants to grow is the carbon from the carbon dioxide. That's why they release oxygen because they're retaining the carbon and then they're releasing that dioxide part into the air as oxygen. When plant material falls into the soil uh, or we amend our soil with the plant material, then that carbon from the plants goes into the soil. For the most part, the carbon in the soil is a primary food of soil microorganisms. So it really isn't the plant that is reabsorbing most of that carbon. It's actually the soil microorganisms. So hope that clears it up a little bit. That's my understanding of it, that yes, plants get the bulk of their carbon from the air, and it's all those other bacteria and things that are living in the soil that then take advantage of the carbon once it gets into the soil. So great to see everybody checking in from everywhere. This is just absolutely incredible. Heidi says it sounds great. Denise says it sounds great. Jay says the sound is good. I'm so glad for that because um, I'm always looking to give you the best sound, the best video that I can, and of course the best gardening answers. Um, Della had mentioned a cool morning and I had a cool morning too. I think most of the central U.S. is waking up to probably the coolest morning we've had in a while. We got down into the 40s Fahrenheit overnight and I woke up, went out to get my newspaper and it was downright chilly. Blew through last night, big winds. Lily was actually quite nervous with the storm, had to calm her down. And now we're looking for a cooler week. This is going to be the coolest week we've had, I think, since probably late April or early May. So it's definitely portending the end of the gardening season, which is a, a terrible thought. But when the temperature starts cooling, you need to rethink some of what you're doing in your garden. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress. So let's look to see if we have any questions popping up. Um, Chris is asking, can you get mold from wood ash if it had before you burned it? Um, no, you shouldn't. The, the burning process of um, taking the wood, putting fire to it, and then getting ash is going to kill any mold, any virus, any fungus, anything that was growing on that wood. So the ash will be basically just another form of carbon once it's burned. So no, you don't have to worry about any of those kind of um, infections or problems that might have been in the wood. And I thank you, Chris, for starting off the day, asking for people to give a thumbs up, being a great promoter of the channel. Thanks so much, Chris. It's good to see you here every week. Spicy Mustache is here from London. That's great. Coldest bank holiday in August since 50 years. Wow, you're getting cold weather too. Um, it's hard to tell. You know, this... This whole year has just been so crazy. I was talking to a couple buddies last night, and we have absolutely no idea 
what the fall and winter is going to bring. This summer has been incredibly hot for us. We have a lot of people that are guessing this winter is going to be extremely cold and snowy in my region, but you just don't know. So I think for all of us, just because of the craziness that has happened in the world and the craziness in our gardens this year, uh, be prepared for anything. And that's one of the ways you can approach gardening in general. But your weather, the environment, all the stuff that's happening around us as we get cooler, who knows what's going to happen. So I don't want to say I'm excited for it, but um, I am interested just to see what this winter brings. Nicholas is saying, should ash be added directly into the soil or into compost? Um, I have a video about ash because the answer is it depends. Wood ash will raise the pH of soil. And it's a very common soil amendment in many parts of the world. Well, it works if your, if your soil is acidic. If you have a really low pH, you can add ash. It's great as a fertilizer because it's potassium. It's potash that you're adding to your soil and it will help raise the pH. But if you live in an area like mine where the soil pH is already high, we have an alkaline soil, then adding the wood ash to the soil really doesn't do much good. First, the potassium really becomes unusable when the pH gets really high, but also by raising the soil pH, there are a lot of plants that just can't grow in my area once the, the soil becomes too alkaline. So as far as adding ash to your soil, do a soil test before you ever consider that to know what the pH is of your soil. Therefore, for the rest of us who know that we shouldn't be adding it to our soil, yes, we can add it to the compost. And it tends to the composting decomposition the whole pile tends to buffer some of that ph changing effect so you can add wood ash to your compost get a finished compost and then put the compost in your soil you'll get some of those potassium benefits you won't get such a drastic increase in the soil ph if you put wood ash into your compost um, we're rolling right along about 125 people already um, Vince, good day to you. First day of spring here in Australia. That's awesome. I think it's um, wonderful that you're getting into your springtime um, just as we're in our fall thinking about winter. So um, I hope you have a wonderful spring. I hope you have a great growing season. That's incredible. I think that's wonderful. Uh, Laurafil saying, how is charcoal made of carbon and ash made of potassium since charcoal burns to make ash? Uh, well, charcoal will have some potassium within it as well. It's just because um, the, the charcoal is burned to the point that most of that carbon has been turned to ash. Uh, ash does have a carbon component and it has a potassium component. It's just that the charcoal, kind of like biochar, if you've seen my biochar video, is filled with air pockets. And so most of charcoal is actually air, but the actual components of charcoal are carbon with some of that same potassium component. It's just when it's fully burned down, the air is completely gone. And so the ash is kind of more condensed form um, and that's why it, it has more of the potassium because you don't have all the air pockets in ash like you would in charcoal. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. Prepper Chris is saying, sorry to bother chat, but can Mr. Scott get some more thumbs up, please? <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. If you like the video, there's no pressure, of course. I thank you, Chris. But give it a thumbs up because I do try to give the information and it's, it's appreciated. I I have to admit, just like all of us, when someone gives us a thumbs up in real life, we appreciate it. Well, on YouTube, I can't necessarily see your thumbs up, but if you add it to the screen, that, that's a nice way for me to know that you appreciate it. Thanks so much. Janet just got back from the garden. Good for you. 
I don't actually spend much time in the garden in the mornings on Monday because I'm getting ready for the live stream, but that's the first thing I do when I'm done here. Um, I'm not expecting any damage on the plants at all because we didn't get that cold, but I'm guessing when I go out to water here in a little bit, I'm probably not going to have to water that much because it's, it was so cool overnight. We're not going to have the normal evaporation like we do in our dry, windy evenings that we tend to have. Space Captain 66, good morning to you. This is your first year planting a winter garden. So far, so good. Great. I hope you have a, a wonderful winter garden. I'll be doing some videos here as we progress um, in the northern hemisphere and start getting into colder conditions. Um, I have one planned on how to build a cold frame and grow in it to have a winter garden. And I've never done this before, but I'm going to be doing a video on doing um, a double-sided hoop system, basically two layers of plastic um, with PVC pipes. And um, for those of you that have seen the One Yard Revolution channel, that's what he's done to get growing or to get his garden growing in winter. So I'm going to give that a shot this year. So good for you. <coughs> I'm looking forward to doing some of those things as well. Um, okay, Jen Mars is saying, don't know how to thumbs up. Sorry. So just below your screen, just below this video, you should see um, a thumb. And there's a thumb pointing up and there's a thumb pointing down. And all you have to do is just click on the thumbs up. It's it's as simple as that. That's why um, it's one of those easy ways to tell somebody that you appreciate what they're doing. Okay, Chris is asking again, is there a way to get copper fungicide um, off plants? Is that what you're asking? <coughs> um, that's, or that's one of those things that um, if you apply a copper fungicide, it's going to be on the plant um, and it's going to be sticking to the leaves and the rest of the plant. When you water and when it rains, it will gradually dissipate, but, uh, but some of it will actually be absorbed into the plant. So once you put it on, I'm not really aware of a great way to get it off unless you try to water it off right away after putting it on. Um, sixth Ninja, thank you so much. The volume is much better today. So glad to hear that. Uh, I have some other plans that I'll surprise you with as we progress. Uh, as I'm getting more and more into the live streaming and the technical aspects of it and learning how to do it better, um, I've got some other great ways to hopefully help you enjoy the stream a little bit more. Um, look a little more professional, though. I, I don't want to overdo it because we're all just gardeners. I just am hoping that I can add some of the bells and whistles so that when I'm topping, talking about a subject, maybe I can throw in some quick photos. Those are the kind of things that I'm trying to play with right now and learn how to do. So I appreciate the feedback. Thanks so much. Um, Heidi Clark says, can't wait for the cold frame video. I thought it would not work in Zone 7A. Um, I bet you Zone 7A may be an ideal place to use a cold frame. <clears throat> cold frames can do really well They'll increase the temperature within the cold frame easily 10, maybe even 20 degrees in winter, depending on, on how it's made. And so for someone like me, my temperatures can get down to minus 20 as a zone 5. Well, a cold frame allows me to essentially keep an environment above 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, for you in zone 7A, you're already 20 degrees warmer than me in your winter typically. So by using a cold frame, you should easily be able to keep the temperatures within it above 20 degrees, maybe even above freezing throughout much of your winter. So uh, yeah, I'll have the video coming out here in a little bit. I encourage that you try it. You may see that you can grow some plants throughout the winter, the cool season plants that maybe can handle a little bit of cold. Okay, Rose is saying, do I have to rake my wood chip from my bed this fall? Um, depends on the kind of bed that you have, but no, nah, I leave wood chips in place. In fact, if you look at a couple of my recent videos in the background, uh, you may notice that I've got big piles of wood chips that are starting to build up. And I might get it unloaded, but I'll, I'll shoot a video these next couple days and my trailer is loaded with wood chips. 
because I intentionally am adding wood chips to all of my beds in the fall going into the winter. It's a great way to protect the soil. Most of my vegetable garden beds, I will put leaves and grass and straw as the primary mulch, but in even some of my vegetable garden beds this year, I'll be adding wood chips. So no, I don't think it's it's a, a necessarily a good idea to rake the chips off the soil in the fall going into the winter. In the spring, you can and often should rake the mulch off of your soil early in the spring so that the soil warms up faster. And then you can put your plants in and you can put your seeds in and then you can put the mulch back. But going into winter, you should have your soil covered. None of us should have bare soil anywhere in our garden going into the winter. The, the, the weather, the wind, the sun, the cold, all of those are enemies of good soil health. So mulch your soil, be it wood chips or something else going into the winter. And, and it, it also, if, if it's organic, like the wood chips, in the fall and in the spring, when the soil is still warm enough and when it's still moist, you'll have some decomposition on that base of the wood chips, which will help feed your soil as well. So mulch, mulch, mulch into the winter. Dot to Trot's Low Carb Living says, Gardener Scott, is there a way to dry raised beds quickly? We've had six big storms the last few weeks, each dumping six plus inches of rain. Wow, that's a lot of water. My beds are soaking. I've lost five tomato plants so far. Um, I've only had this issue once because my area is so dry. But the best way that has worked for me, if you know rain is coming, cover the bed with an impermeable material like plastic or a tarp so that no more water goes into that bed. And then as soon as the rain is gone, pull the tarp off so that the wind and the sun can help dry out the bed. And then if any moisture looks like it's returning, cover the bed again. And, and it takes work, but it's basically a cover if it's going to get wet again and uncover so that it can dry out, that moisture can evaporate. Um, if you've got plants growing in it, that's that's basically what you're going to have to do. If there's no plants, then you can let the top dry out a little bit, maybe turn the soil, um, try to basically uncover some of the, the lower levels and let them dry out. I do not recommend digging in wet soil, however. You can really destroy your soil structure if you dig in it when it's wet. So try that. Try that cover, uncover, cover, uncover. That's about the only way I know that you can do it unless you were to bring a big fan out and try blowing it artificially. But um, the sun, assuming you're getting sun between the storms, should help dry it out, though it's going to take a little while. Okay, um, let's see what we get here. Jeff Davis says... Um, uh, oh, I think you might be answering someone else. Can also inject BT into the stems just ahead of the borers once they get inside to try to prevent it. Um, yeah, I've talked a lot about borers in recent weeks. So um, that's one of those things that um, depending on the plant and depending on the borer, once the borer is in the plant, yes, you can use a systemic pesticide, some types of BT, and you might be able to kill the borer. But in most cases, since the plant is done for, it often just becomes best to pull the plant and toss it so you don't have those borers becoming full adults and laying more eggs in the soil for the following season. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about choosing garlic. I see that Don Bruce is saying, going to try garlic for the first time. Can you explain the difference between hardneck and softneck varieties and which specific variety is my favorite. So I actually have a video dedicated to this. It's about choosing garlic. So I'll go into it a little bit now, but, but definitely look for that video in my library where I talk all about hardnecks and softnecks and the different varieties and the ones 
and, and I did the video this time last year. So I was talking about what varieties I was planning to grow. Um, so that's much more in depth. But basically, uh, when it comes to garlic, and I'll start with this. The one thing I wanted to talk about today to make sure I don't forget, I put my I, a note down for myself. If you're planning on growing garlic this year, order it now. Or go to your nursery and they might even have it in place. But put your order in now to get garlic because if this fall is anything like the spring, you don't want to wait to get your garlic because by the time you go to get it, that might be gone. That's very common. There's a lot of online sources. Most local nurseries will carry garlic bulbs. But get it now or as soon as you can just to make sure that you've got garlic to grow this year. But there are two basic types of garlic. There are hard neck varieties and there are soft neck varieties. And chances are the garlic you buy at the store is a soft neck variety. It grows very well in warm regions. So if you're zone seven or zone eight, then a soft neck variety will probably do better in your garden. Hard neck varieties actually have a center stalk that grows through it and it hardens. That's why it's called a hard neck variety. The soft neck is more like an onion where it's got the, the floppy leaves. Hard neck varieties do much better in cold regions. So if you're a zone four, five, six, then you will probably have better success with hard neck varieties. Now, that being said, I'm in zone 5B. I do grow more hard necks than I do soft necks, and I have relatively equal success. But, but the hard necks do better. They produce bigger bulbs for me than the soft neck varieties do. Uh, as far as choosing my favorite variety, um, Enchilium Red was my favorite variety for a long time. Um, this year, I have a few that that um, seem to have been doing pretty well. I, I mentioned a little bit about that in the um, garlic video that I have that just came out last night. So if you haven't seen that garlic video last night, that tells the entire process from putting the seeds, the garlic cloves in the ground all the way to harvest. So look for that video as well if you're new to garlic uh, and how to grow it. Um, but I think a Siberian um, is one that I had really good success with this year. That one turned out to pre be pretty good. Romanian Red worked pretty well for me this year. Those are both hard neck varieties. So I'm, I try growing a lot of different varieties every year. And I can't say <laughs> that I have a particular favorite. Music, if I were to recommend a variety for brand new garlic growers, I'd probably recommend music. It does well in most regions. Uh, it has good flavor and it, you'd probably be happy with it. So um, this is definitely time of year to start thinking about garlic. That's why I put the video out last night. And I do have other videos in my library talking about garlic. So this is the time of year to learn about it. If you haven't done garlic, it is a great, easy plant to grow in your garden. The, the worst thing about garlic, in my opinion, is that you have to be careful about where you place it because it's going to be in the ground for nine months. It takes that, that long to grow garlic. You put it in in fall and you harvest it in summer. So take some time right now. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, take some time right now. Scope out an area of your garden, a particular bed or half of a bed that you know you can just leave it alone for nine months and it's not going to bother your normal gardening plan. <clears throat> and that's where you can put in your garlic. And then be sure and amend the soil really, really well. Add lots of organic material because, again, you're not going to be able to add anything to the soil in that nine months. So get it really re re enriched now. And then as we get closer to winter in fall, most of us are putting our garlic in the ground in October, give or take a little bit. 
Um, so you have now until October to get your bed ready to go, to get your garlic ordered after figuring out what variety is going to work best for you. And then you can put it in the ground and basically just sit back for nine months because it's really easy to grow after that point. John Ann Johnson is saying, do you think it's worth growing garlic in 9B? Our shallots don't clove, not sure if garlic would. 9B is a really tough zone to grow garlic in. Look up Creole garlic, you know, like Louisiana Creole. There are some varieties of Creole garlic that can grow in zones 8 and 9. That's probably your best bet. It's going to be a soft neck variety. You might want to grow it in an area that gets a little bit extra shade, especially in the winter, so that it can have as cool temperature as possible in winter. That's what garlic needs. Garlic needs the cool or cold winter temperatures. So it's possible to grow garlic in zone 9, but you're going to have to be very diligent in your search to pick out a variety especially suited for zone nine. And I do know there are some Creole varieties. I think there's some black garlic varieties that can also do well in the heat. So maybe that'll give you the start to try to check something else. I hope you find something, John Ann, because um, it's easy to grow. It's so great to, to, to harvest it and then use it. And the video I've got coming out on Wednesday um, I made old-fashioned pickles with my pickling cucumbers, the dill from my garden, and the garlic from my garden. And so I've been eating pickles for weeks, and I'll be eating pickles for weeks more with all of the ingredients from my garden, especially the garlic, because I really like garlic added to pickles. So um, I hope you can find a variety that works for you. Um, La Marineda, how can I get rid of zucchini bugs? Um, <clears throat> Right now, the best thing to do is just go out and pluck them off. Take a bag, take a bucket of soapy water, take something, take people with you and try to pluck off um, any type of squash bug that you can find um, and, and just toss it in the water, toss it in the bag, get rid of it from your garden. There isn't a whole lot. You can try spraying neem oil on your plants. I don't really find that to be as effective if used outside, especially for squash bugs. Um, but looking to the future, and this is a repeat for those of you that are regular watchers, but encourage the bugs, encourage the frogs, encourage all of the animals in your landscape that might be predators for any type of plant pest that you have. And eventually things will balance out. But I do that. If I happen to see any type of squash bug uh, when I'm watering, I just pull it off. I've, I've tried spraying them off with the water, but they're pretty strong, durable bugs. And even spraying them off with water like you can an aphid, it'll kill an aphid, but it won't necessarily kill a squash bug. So manual removal is about the best thing that I suggest if you can get them before their population explodes too much. Okay, um, let's see. Jay Dixon is talking to Jinmar, saying, I'm buying in Canada. I'm aware of some USA seed companies but have no direct experience. Um, Gardner Scott had a video about seed buying in the USA. Um, so thank you, Jay, for sharing that. Uh, yeah, and so those of you that are new to gardening or new to my channel or new to the live stream, I have now over 200 videos in my library and I tr I've covered almost everything about basic gardening to include where I buy the seeds, how to choose seeds, the difference between GMO and non-GMO seeds. So if you've got a question, by all means, check back in my library and you may be able to find an answer to the question. And if you don't find the video or you don't find an answer to your question in a video of mine, well, then send me a, a, a message in the community or on Facebook. And I'm constantly adding video ideas to my list based on what you all are suggesting to me. So I've, I've said this before. I have over 400 ideas on my video list and it doesn't include everything. So I'm constantly adding new ideas. 
<clears throat> that I come up with in the garden, but also that someone else might suggest. Thanks, Janana. I appreciate that super sticker. Thumbs thumbs up to you too. I, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, okay, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about season extending today. And I've kind of touched a little bit on it already where we were talking about the cold frames, talking about the hoops. But just like this is the time of year for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's also time to start thinking about what you're going to do going into the winter. And this also holds true for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere. Your spring is just starting in Australia. You also need to think about season extending. So this time of year, take some time to go out to your garden and start thinking about what plants you have growing right now that you need protection for if the weather gets cold. And conversely, for New Zealand and South Africa and Australia and Indonesia, start thinking about what you can do to protect your plants from whatever might come in the next month or two before you're actively putting a lot of plants in the ground. Typically, this means setting up some type of hoop system. And I have a, a video on different types of hoops and how you can set them up. The type of hoop really doesn't matter. The idea is just something that you can put over your plants. And then you cover the hoop with some type of covering that allows for extra heat to build up around the plants. Typically, that's plastic. It can be cloth. It can be any material that acts as essentially a blanket. And the idea behind it is you have this covering, usually plastic, over hoops on your beds. During the day, the soil will warm up. And then at night, because you now have a cover over it, the soil will stay warmer longer because as that heat radiates from the soil, it hits the barrier that you've created on these hoops. Now the air stays warmer, which means the entire environment is warmer around your plants. And so the reason I say now's the time to think about it is because... You've got to get your hoops set up. You have to think about what material you're going to use to cover them. You have to start looking at your weather forecasts. So those of us that are summer going into fall, the, the temperatures are still warm during the day. So you'll probably need to remove the cover off of your hoops during the day so it doesn't get too hot. And then late in the day, you put your cover in place to help retain that heat. And then eventually, as the days start getting colder, you'll leave the cover in place during the entire day just because it gets so cold outside. And that enables you to grow at least two weeks, often a month or more longer than you might normally be able to do. The inverse happens in the Southern Hemisphere. You start off with hoops over your beds where you're sowing your seeds or you're putting your transplants in and you leave the cover on to warm up that environment as much as possible to ensure germination and ensure that those young seedlings can begin to grow. Then as the days get warmer, you'll be removing the plastic from the hoops and eventually reach the point that you just uh, take it off completely because you don't need it because your days are warm. So start thinking about that right now. I have a couple videos. As I said, I'll be making more as we proceed into the next season. But now's the time to educate yourself so that you can be ahead of the game. So as temperatures change, you know what to do and you know how to protect your plants, either when they're getting colder or when they're getting hotter. And it's great because you really can extend your season. You can keep growing. I've harvested cool season plants well into November and December here in Colorado in my zone five garden because of coverings. And it's actually, I think I've mentioned this in a couple videos where for Thanksgiving, you go out in late November 
and you're harvesting spinach and root crops to use in your Thanksgiving dinner, even if there's snow on the ground, if you've got that season extending, if you've got that cover on your plants, uh, the season just keeps going and going. So definitely consider that if it's new to you. Um, if you've done it before, start thinking about maybe expanding it. And that's why I'm going to go with the two-layer hoop system this year because I, I always do a single hoop over the plants that I want to save, but I haven't done the, the double hoop. So I'm trying that as something new this year. Okay, and so uh, if you don't know how to access my library, there's a couple ways to do it. So again, below the screen here, off to the left-hand side, you'll see my smiling face right next to where it says Gardner Scott. If you click on my smiling face, it'll take you to my main channel page. And on the main channel page, you can find all of my videos. Now on that main channel page, you could click on videos and that'll give the entire list of videos. You can click on playlists because I've divided my videos up into different playlists that all have a common theme. Or you can scroll on that main page all the way down to the bottom and you'll see some of my most popular videos, You'll see videos I have about tomatoes. You'll see options for, for playlists. You'll see the videos that I've most recently uploaded. It's all there on that main page of Gardner Scott. If you don't click on my face, um, then you can just go to the top and do a YouTube search for Gardner Scott. And that'll also bring up my smiling face. And you click on that and that will take you to my main channel page. So. I encourage you to scope that out. As we move into winter here in the north, that's what I do every winter, is I'll go to my favorite gardening channels, and I watch a lot of gardening videos from other channels, and I'll go to their main page, I'll check out their videos and find one that I haven't seen before, and something that interests me, and then I'll start watching videos from their main channel page. So an easy way to access my library, an easy way to see what material is out there, and I encourage you to do it. And you can also subscribe from that main page as well. There's a big red subscribe button on that page, kind of on the right-hand side that, that you can click on if you're interested. Okay, <clears throat> what else have we got? D.D. O'Brien says, I'm the white rabbit today, was out hunting snails and slugs in the garden. Good for you. Um, I'm going to actually start doing that. We had some rain yesterday. We had rain a couple days ago. The temperatures are cooling. I normally don't have a slug problem in my garden because it's just so dry. But I'm going to start looking out for slugs because this is the time of year for me when slugs start appearing in the garden because the temperatures cool and the conditions are getting moist in the beds and the mulch. So um, I like that white rabbit comparison. So if you don't have a slug problem, well, this time of year, if you typically get a wet fall, you may. So yeah, be a, a white rabbit like Dee Dee and get out there and always inspect your beds. Carla, there you are this week. Thank you so much. Thank you for your latest vids. I get motivation and enthusiasm from them. Um, thank you. That's why I do them, of course. I'm so glad you appreciated it. Uh, the one I did last night, uh, an entire year of growing garlic. And I started filming it last October, and I just finished it last week. So uh, I love doing the videos. I love them being comprehensive, and I am trying to do my best to give you that motivation and enthusiasm so you can see whatever the project is, whatever it is my video is, it's it's to get you out in the garden. I'm already in the garden. I'm already motivated. I'm already enthusiastic. But if, yeah, my video can get you motivated and enthusiastic about gardening, go for it. Get out there. Do it. Get it done. Um, just because it's so wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, man pig. I hate white rabbits. Um, I, I'm actually planning a video, I think, I think it's Friday's video that's coming out where I talk about rabbits in my garden and one way to deal with your rabbits so they're not a problem. So 
I don't hate the rabbits in my garden because I've kind of learned how to deal with them. So uh, that's interesting that you say that garden, you know, being the um, the gardeners that we all are, rabbits are often our nemesis, but uh, you can deal with them. You can welcome them and they may actually do some work for you. And that's what I'll be talking about in Friday's video. Um, so River Song, since we've been talking about garlic um, today, you say, please speak about garlic in containers. That's a really good question. Um, if you're planning to grow garlic in containers, which is a great idea, do realize garlic needs cold temperatures during the winter. So if you're growing herbs in a container, you might bring the herbs inside to a nice, warm, protected environment when it's winter outside. You don't necessarily want to do that with garlic. Uh, a, a really relatively simple but good idea, if you can dig a trench in some area of your garden and then put the containers that you're growing garlic in in the trench and then fill the containers with soil, that'll help give you a much more moderated winter temperature. But the garlic needs cold, first off. Don't bring them into a warm garage. You probably won't have good results. Garlic does require more room to grow than you might think as well. As in the video I talk about, six inches of separation between garlic, that's a good target. So depending on the size of your container, you might only be able to grow three or four garlic cloves in a typical 10 gallon bucket, maybe five, but I wouldn't push it. I wouldn't try to grow more garlic in a container than a handful, just because you want the bulbs to get as big as possible. Just like in a bed, you're not gonna be able to enrich the soil after the garlic is in place. So start with a good, rich soil. Um, often a soilless mix is fine, but make sure you have a good soil mix in the container to start with. Keep it cold in winter, spread out the garlic, and then in the spring, you're going to have to water more often because containers dry out faster. So expect that you're probably gonna have to water those garlic containers every day. And because it takes nine months from start to finish, there's going to be probably three months of warm weather, spring going into summer, where you have to make sure you're watering every day so that that soil doesn't dry out. The, it's not gonna kill the garlic plants if they dry out a little bit, but I've noticed that in beds where the soil tends to be drier and not as rich with organic material, the bulbs just don't grow as big. They prefer the rich soil and a constantly moist environment. James Goodwin, thank you so much for that super chat contribution. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for being here today. I hope I'm helping out. Uh, okay, so let's see what else we've got popping up here. Carrie Ramirez with a frowny, angry face. Once my pole beans grew six feet high, but right before they started to flower, a rabbit snipped the stems on each of them. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I I strongly encourage bird netting. That's that's what I often use um, in, in earlier gardens where I've had a, a squirrel problem <clears throat> or a rabbit problem or even a deer problem. If you can put bird netting around your plants, it keeps all of those pests out. So I'm sorry to hear it happen to you with your pole beans, but this is one of those lessons to learn. Consider now, in, now knowing that the rabbits are gonna eat your beans, um, put a, a fence of bird netting around your beds in the future, and that should really go a long way in keeping the rabbits away from your beans. Roger Rabbit is nice in books and film, but um, I'm a Mr. McGregor when it comes to rabbits most of the time. Okay, um, Kim Ye is saying, Gardener Scott, can you put garlic cloves in the refrigerator prior to planting if it doesn't get below 32 in California? Um, yes, you can, actually. Um, but <clears throat> not sure how much success you'll have because 
um, there's different phases. So the, the clothes need to start growing. They'll actually send out roots when you start planting them in the fall. Then they'll go dormant. And it's during that dormant period that they're really looking for cold temperatures. And then it warms up again and they start growing right away in spring. And as I show in last night's video, my garlic is, was growing through the snow. So that's what that shows perfectly how they're not affected by cold. If you, and this actually gets back to the earlier question, if you're growing in an environment where it doesn't get below freezing, you might consider growing in containers and you can actually take the whole container into a cold environment. And, you know, like uh, I, I knew someone once, I've never done this, but at work, I don't remember where it was, but they had access to a walk-in freezer. And that's what they did, actually, is they grew garlic in containers. And then they carried the container into the walk-in freezer and, like, stuck it in the back for a month or so. And that's how they were able to grow garlic in a warm region. So um, it just popped into my head because I'd forgotten it. It was so long ago. Um, you might have some success by doing something like that. But starting with the cloves in the cold and then planting them in their warm from that point on, you'll get some bulb development. Uh, and I have a, a buddy, Jason, that grows green garlic. And so he kind of grows it that way. And so he's harvesting it when the garlic is still young. It, the, the bulb is only about the size of a clove, a little bit bigger than the initial clove that you plant. But he uh, uses it in the kitchen. He's a chef. And he uses basically young garlic when it's grown in a warm region and uses that kind of like shallots in the kitchen. But they have a, the more of the garlic flavor. So um, you might consider some of those issues if you're trying to grow or, again, if California, you don't get the cold, look into a Creole variety and you might not have to worry as much about the cold temperatures. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Um, Dr. Trot is asking a question for the peanut gallery. I have to move three cone flowers. Is it best to transplant in fall or wait until spring? Um, you could do either. I think spring is a better time to transplant your cone flowers, uh, but I've transplanted cone flowers in the fall with, with pretty good success. Do cut off all the flowers, cut back some of the leaves if you transplant in the fall so that you don't have um, a lot of requirement for the roots to supply an entire plant because the roots are going to be damaged during the transplanting. So you'll need to cut back um, if you've ever done irises or daylilies like that, it's the same thing. Cut back some of the foliage if you do in the fall. That's why I tend to think spring is better because you can transplant as soon as the soil is warm. You can dig up your cone flowers, divide them even, and put them into another area before they've started growing. And then as they start growing, the roots will be comparable to the top growth. And that's why you might have better success in the spring. But I haven't really talked about this part of it before. So in our gardening activities and in our gardening world, we have <clears throat> the best advice and we have good advice. And then we have what needs to be done. And so I'll use this as, as an example. Transplanting cone flowers might be best to do in spring. It can be good, can be okay in fall. You shouldn't do it at all in the summer when it's baking. But if you need to do it, if you're moving or if you're having construction done or there's some issue where you have plants and you need to move them, then move them. You don't necessarily have to wait for a good time or for the best time. And I, a lot of the plants that I move from house to house over the years, you can't always choose when you move and make sure it aligns closely with your garden season. 
And so I've often dug up plants in the heat of summer or dug up plants in fall that are best dug up in spring. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. So I think it's better to to dig up a plant to save it because you need that space for whatever other reason than to lose the plant completely. You may still lose the plant if you weren't able to keep it alive during the transplanting process. That happens. But I'd much rather dig up a plant that needs to be dug up with hopes that I can transplant it someplace else than to wait knowing that it's not a good time and then just definitely lose it because it's going to get parked on by a tractor or whatever. So that's a little bit of my thoughts when it comes to transplanting. Um, for example, I did that this year with some daylilies. I have overgrown daylilies. I was putting in a daisy plant. The daylilies were encroaching on that plant. I went ahead and dug up the daylilies in that space. Wasn't the best time of year. Uh, I put the daisy in. The, the transplanted daylilies are actually doing pretty good. Only because I focused on that as a need and made sure that I took care of the daylilies in their new spot, kept them watered during the full heat of summer, and, and they bounce back pretty good. So, um, yes, if you have the ability and the time and you're not going anywhere, wait for the best time to do a lot of these gardening activities that I'll recommend and other channels recommend. But if you need to do it, just go and do it. Okay, Jay Dixon is saying, RE, the best good, bad. Had that very issue with a client who wanted me to severely prune an expensive tree at the worst possible time for no good reason. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. That's one of those kind of things, especially for people that don't know much about gardening um, and for new gardeners. It, you know, New gardeners will often make a mistake just because you haven't learned yet. Definitely learn from it. But um, yeah, I've, I've known people like that as well that just want something pruned. Um, there's uh, lilacs, for instance, or one of those kind of plants. Lilacs are best pruned in the spring if you want flowers the following year. But I know people that their lilacs are overgrown. They need to prune in their mind. And so they prune after all the flower buds have been set. And then they complain that the next year they don't get any flowers. Well, it's because they pruned at the wrong time because they felt they had a need to prune. Whereas if they would have just had patience or like in Jay's case, listen to somebody who knew what they were doing, maybe they wouldn't have had such a problem going into the future. So yeah, especially when it's an expensive tree, um, I, I feel the pain. Thank you for sharing that. Veronica saying, thank you for your garlic video. Can't wait to plant them and it'll be my first time. Good. That's great. I, I, I hope you have a great season um, and I hope you have good success with your garlic. It, it, it is one of those things that when you harvest, because it took nine months and the garlic that you grow yourself tastes so much better, um, it, it's, it's incredible. We all know that, that the things we harvest and grow in our own garden taste better. But the garlic varieties that you can choose to grow are just so explosive in flavor when compared to what we typically buy in the store. That is just incredible. So for all of you, um, especially you, Veronica, as you grow garlic moving forward, try to choose a variety, maybe one or two, depending on what space you're doing. <clears throat> but when you harvest try to do new things with that garlic. So if you typically are using garlic in a pasta sauce, definitely do that. But if you've never roasted an entire bulb of garlic and you drizzle a little olive oil over it, oh, it changes the flavor so dramatically. Do that if you've never done it before. If you've never pickled garlic, try that. If you've never powdered garlic, do that. And I have some videos on some of this. Um, I'll be doing a video on powdering garlic and pickling garlic. Uh, I'll actually be doing the video soon, but I probably won't release it till next year, closer to garlic harvest time. But 
Yeah, if you're growing garlic for the first time or expanding the amount of garlic you're growing, try new things with that garlic when you harvest it. Uh, and it's incredible. It's it's so um, so much of a taste explosion to ferment or pickle garlic cloves and then make a salad and slice up that pickled garlic. Oh, it's a whole new experience. So with everything in the garden, but especially garlic, you can really get some really cool new taste sensations when you learn how to use garlic in new ways. So that's cool. Um, so Veneth is asking, and I know Raymond has been asking, <clears throat> have I ever done Korean natural farming? And so I'm planning a video a little bit, um, I think two months ahead is when I have it programmed, so about two months from now, where I'll talk about Korean natural farming. So I practice many of the, the ideas within Korean natural farming. I don't focus on that one thing, because as you know, if you've watched my videos and even in these live streams, I do everything that I possibly can. I spread my garden beds around. I make different beds. I'm always trying something new. So Korean natural farming is a basic concept where you're really focusing on the soil, really trying to enrich the soil naturally in addition to creating a natural environment. Well, that's what I do. So if you've seen my soil videos, if you've seen my insect videos, that's what I'm talking about. And though I don't specifically refer to what I'm doing as Korean natural farming, there's a lot of similarities in how I grow and the philosophies of Korean natural farming. And because there's a lot of similarities in how I do it, that's why I'm planning a video to show you in a couple months based on my own garden and how I've used some of those practices. So um, I, I haven't done it as an exclusive way to garden, but I have used a lot of those principles in my overall philosophy of how to garden. And, and I'll go much more in depth in that uh, in the future. If you don't know about Korean natural farming, do a search for it. And you'll see you might already be doing some of those principles as well. If you're trying to develop a natural environment where the birds are working with the insects, which are working with the soil organisms, and you're planting accordingly to take advantage of that natural system. Um, it really, really has some good ideas. Jeremy Hanks, thank you for that super chat. Thanks, Gardner Scott. First live stream, loving your extensive library of videos. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. that. That's why I created the library, is for all of you to binge watch gardening videos. The, the Gardner Scott channel, in my opinion, is a master class for gardening. I really do try to cover everything gardening. So thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I, I appreciate that feedback because that's why I do it. And it does make me feel good when people acknowledge and recognize that. So thank you so much. Um, okay, yeah, Raymond said thank you for the summary. I know you've been asking about this for, for weeks now, Raymond. And um, the reason I'm planning it, just so you know, there's so many topics that I am planning to release at different times of year. And a lot of you have picked up on this, um, especially with the garlic video last night. I got a lot of comments this morning saying, perfect, I was just ordering garlic or I was just thinking about planting garlic. Well, I try to release my videos as close to the time that they can to give you the best benefit from that information. And so like with um, Korean natural farming, this is one of those things that you need to plan for and you need to think about, and that's why I'm going to release it in the winter so that you'll have time to learn more about it, plan your garden for next year, and, and then you'll know about Korean natural farming. If I released it right now, I don't think it would have as much impact, um, but you're very welcome. Um, I know you've been looking forward to that, Raymond. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up here. Um, you guys are talking back and forth. That's great. Rachel is saying, isn't it funny how you can practice certain behaviors 
and then find out it has an official name. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, things like uh, I did a video a few months ago talking about square foot gardening. Well, yeah, I've been doing square foot gardening uh, years ago before I knew it was called square foot gardening. I didn't necessarily measure out a square foot, but yes, I've done some of that. And I've grown in mulch piles of hay and straw, just like Ruth Stout's method. And I grow plants in wood chips, just like Back to Eden. So learning these different principles and concepts and names for how you garden is great for conversation. It's also great once you know what it's called that you can do more searches and get more information about it. But I think so much of this is just as good gardening sense. And then somebody comes along and takes a good idea and writes a book about it. And now that's the name we give to it. But uh, if it's a good idea, it's a good idea regardless of what it's called. And I mix up all of these different um, ways of gardening. I'll pick the best of one and the best of another, and I'll put it together. <clears throat> and someday, maybe I'll write a book on the Gardener Scott way of gardening and just show you my amalgamation of all these different ideas. Um, I'll do that when I retire from active gardening, maybe someday. Uh, but yes, it is interesting how we do something and we don't know what it's called, but it still works. That's great. Um, Catherine Brooks is asking for the winter. I need to amend the soil and add mulch on top. So um, yes, and I talked about this in the very beginning of the video or in the video or that's live stream. Maybe you missed it. But yes, going into winter, um, definitely uh, plan on mulching. It depends on amending. And so I've got a video that I'll be releasing next next month that shows how I amend my beds going into the winter because my soil is still not good. It's not enriched like it needs to be. So if your soil is not perfect, if it's not wonderful, then I usually recommend that you amend in the fall so that you have late fall, winter, early spring for all those soil organisms to work on decomposing that organic material in your soil. And then, yes, always mulch your beds going into the winter with an organic mulch so those same um, soil organisms can break down the lower layers of that mulch. If you have really good soil, if you've been amending every year for years, at about the three to five year point, you could actually harm your plants by continuing to amend your soil because your soil can be so nutrient rich that the plants won't be able to absorb nutrients. And this is the craziness of, of nutrients in the soil and why you shouldn't over fertilize. Because if you have an abundance of a particular nutrient, like um, phosphorus, for instance, you can have too much phosphorus in your soil. And so what happens is the plant is taking up whatever that nutrient is in abundance. And because it's taking up so much of that nutrient, it isn't taking up other nutrients that it might need. And that's what happens when you over fertilize is you're basically locking out all the other nutrients from some of those primary nutrients that are in the fertilizer. Same thing happens if you over amend your soil. You could be locking out some of the nutrients that plants need. So in that case, if you do have good soil, if you have been amending for years, then I would suggest you don't amend in the fall. Still mulch but your soil should be nutrient and nutrient rich enough going into the spring that you don't have to worry about it. It's all about building the soil. And when your soil is built, it's got everything that the plants need. Jennifer is saying, can I put powdery mildew plants in my compost pile? Cucumbers <clears throat> and zucchini. Yes, I think so. Um, there's a couple of um, thoughts about this. I talked about this a couple weeks ago in one of the live streams um, where Charles Dowding has big hot compost piles. And so you can put diseased plants of all types 
in a hot compost pile that's getting above 160 degrees Fahrenheit and it's going to kill anything in it. Um, I don't do hot composting like that. My compost piles are very cool, but I still put plants with powdery mildew in it. Why? Because the powdery mildew spores are everywhere and they do the least amount of damage buried in the soil. It's when they're on the surface of the soil and they're blowing through the air that the powdery mildew is going to happen on your plants. So if you add plants that have powdery mildew to your compost pile, they'll break down. You won't necessarily kill the spores, but when you use that compost as amendment in the soil, well, those, spor those spores aren't gonna find their way to your leaves if you use mulch and they just become extra food for the soil organisms. So um, a lot of those type of problems with plants, powdery mildew is, is one of the least issues in the garden as far as a disease is concerned. And uh, I have no problem composting it as long as you're gonna put that compost in the soil. If you're making your compost to use as a mulch and there's gonna be no additional mulch on top of it, then I probably wouldn't add the powdery mildewed cucumber plants just because the spores are gonna be there. And when you water in rain, they're gonna bounce off of that mulch or yeah, back, they're gonna bounce off of the compost you're using as mulch onto your leaves. Um, bury the compost as an amendment and you shouldn't have that issue. Okay. Um, yeah, Indiana backyard gardener is saying they'll they'll compost, but the disease will stay in the soil. Um, yeah, that's true. But as long as they're buried, that those spores aren't going to make it to your leaves. And again, that's why I always mulch. And I say that in videos, why I, I mulch my tomatoes so that nothing is going to bounce from the soil that might be in the soil back onto my leaves. And eventually, um, in time, whatever's in your soil will dissipate because of the bacteria and everything else, the earthworms that work their way, and those spores will eventually die as well. Okay, um, Jennifer says, thank you, just started chipping wood for mulch. Good for you. Um, I, I'm i gonna take down some of my trees that were damaged in my April freeze. Um, they shouldn't be there anyway. Um, they're willow trees. Willow trees are terrible in Colorado, but somebody put willow trees in the, my back property. We had a terrible freeze in April that devastated all the trees in the area. I'm gonna take them down and I'm planning to chip those up as well. So um, anytime you can get wood chips in your garden, I suggest adding wood chips to your garden. I know some of you are in very wet environments. In Indonesia where it's always wet, wood chips can encourage a lot of pests and diseases if you have a lot of them in your garden. But for many of us that have good cold winters and hot summers, wood chips really can make a difference in the garden. Okay, Diane is saying, Gardner Scott, my once beautiful hydrangeas are drooping and barely growing. Probably has something to do with a lot of grandchildren pulling a lot of blooms. Any suggestions? Um, if they're pulling the blooms, if they're pulling the flowers off, um, it shouldn't actually create that big an issue because as long as the leaves are still growing, there should be enough photosynthesis to generate plant growth. So if you're seeing that the, they're drooping and not growing well, um, check your soil. You know, it might be one of those issues where your soil is just dissipated. Yeah, you know, dig away some of the soil. If you don't see any organic material, if, it, if it's not a rich brown color, um, then you might need to think about adding some fertilizers. Uh, you know, hopefully you're checking your your watering patterns to make sure you're not overwatering or underwatering. But it could just be your plants getting old and it's it's depleted the nutrients in that particular area of your garden, and you may need to consider some fertilizers. So get down there and dig around the plants. Um, it, I'm not aware off the top of my head of any particular pest, um, an insect like a borer that would affect hydrangeas. Um, so it, it's probably not a pest issue, but look at your plants. You may, 
you may see something eating your leaves and so it's not getting the photosynthesis so just get down there close to the plant and in the soil and see if maybe you can um, do some detective work and see what might be causing some of those issues okay i also want to talk a little bit um, today about tomato harvests and uh, for those of us this time of year and this ties in with my moment of discovery so this week, my moment of discovery was the very first sun gold tomato on a plant. And so as, as you probably guess, it didn't make it into the kitchen because it went immediately from the plant into my mouth. But I had my first sun gold tomato this week, such a delicious tomato. Um, and so I look forward to many more of those. But that's why I wanted to talk about tomatoes. As we start moving into cooler weather, and for me, as I mentioned, we had 40 degree temperatures overnight. When the nighttime temperatures start dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's 10 degrees Celsius, when your nighttime temperatures start dropping below those thresholds, you're probably going to see less production on your tomato plants. And so, that's a good cue to consider pruning off the tips of your tomatoes. And I've talked about this before as well. So you can go back into some of my earlier live streams, look for the timestamps in the description, and it can take you to some of these discussions. But to stop the growth of your tomato plants, you prune off the tips. And when the temperature first drops below 50 degrees at night, that's kind of a, a clue that cooler weather is coming. It's going to affect the growth of your plant. It's going to affect the flower production on your tomato plants. And it's definitely going to affect the fruiting because if it gets too cold, the, the flowers aren't gonna fertilize or if they do fertilize, it's gonna take longer for that tomato to grow, that the actual fruit to develop to maturity. So, this is the time of year to start looking at your temperatures as they relate to your tomato plant and that will affect pruning it will also affect the harvest because the harvest and the maturing of the fruit will slow down in cooler weather this isn't that big an issue because tomatoes are one of the few fruits that you can harvest and it will continue to ripen off of the plant. The ethylene gas that is produced is what causes the fruit to ripen. So if a freeze is in your forecast, if really cold weather is in your forecast, go ahead and start thinking about harvesting the fruit even if it's not fully ripe and it will continue to ripen. I've got a video about this coming in a couple weeks, but I just wanted to go ahead and throw out this information right now because it's one of those topics where we all who grow tomatoes get to the end of the season and there's just so many green tomatoes left on the plants and there's not much we can do about it. You can try covering them with plastic to get the season extending, but it really doesn't work because you might be able to save the plants when the temperatures get that cold but you're usually not able to keep the temperatures up during the day to ripen everything so think about pruning your tomatoes as it gets cold think about pruning or think about harvesting a little bit early when it gets cold and this also holds true i've had some questions in this last week about pests birds and squirrels and other animals that are eating the tomato fruit if you have that problem with a pest that's eating your tomatoes before you harvest it, well then start harvesting earlier because the animals in most cases are, are gonna be eating the ripest fruit. So if you harvest your tomatoes before they reach that fully ripe stage where that animal pest is eating it and then take it inside and allow it to continue ripening on your counter or in your pantry, then you don't have to deal with those pests that are eating the ripe tomatoes. So a couple ideas I wanted to throw out at you this week because this is prime tomato growing season and something to think about. And for those of you that are 
on the other side of the world that are just starting to think about growing tomatoes and peppers and similar plants and you have those animal pests same thing holds true harvest early but also this is the time of year to start thinking about putting up some of the barriers planning for those barriers to help keep some of those pests away okay let's see what else we have popping up any other questions um dot to trot is saying i have about 20 tomatoes in my basement in boxes with bananas to ripen yes and that gets back to that to ethylene gas um, bananas are one of the best things to advance the ripening of your tomatoes because they're putting off so much of that gas as they continue to ripen on the counter so um, absolutely if you've got tomatoes that you want to ripen you can set them uh, on the counter and they will ripen but if you put them near a banana they'll ripen even faster so thank you for throwing that out there because that is great advice to get uh, tomatoes ripening okay laura full saying next year we will have a good number of peppers instead of all tomatoes good for you break it up a little bit um i'm actually having a pretty good pepper here hot peppers do well um sweet peppers don't do so well in my region i was ready to pull up my pepper plants after they were devastated by the hail that i had earlier in the season they were basically twigs after that hailstorm and I seriously considered pulling them up and putting something else in that place, probably tomatoes. Um, but I left them in place and they're doing great. So if you've got good success with tomatoes or like growing tomatoes, absolutely um, add some peppers to the mix. And next year, um, well actually, no, because I didn't get the everything growing this year. So next year, I'll probably have a video talking about a salsa garden, just like I talked earlier about growing everything you need to make pickles. I'll grow everything you need to make salsa. And so I'll grow the tomatoes, I'll grow the peppers, I'll grow the garlic, I'll grow the onions. This year, my onions aren't doing so well, and I forgot to plant cilantro. I like cilantro in my salsa. Um, but think about that aspect as you're finishing this gardening season and looking at what did well and thinking about next year and what new things you can try. Start going with a theme to your garden. Uh, if you like my old-fashioned pickle video that's coming out here in a couple days, then you grow the dill and the cucumbers and the garlic to make old-fashioned pickles. If you like the idea of salsa because you eat a lot of salsa, then next year grow tomatoes and peppers and onions and cilantro. If you like the idea of making a wonderful pasta sauce, well, then grow paste tomatoes and grow thyme and oregano and whatever other herbs you're growing so this is a great time of year to look to next year and think about what you could have grown this year so you're harvesting your tomatoes and going inside and making a sauce and then you go to the store to buy all the herbs well stop yourself and say next year i'm going to go ahead and grow some herbs so i don't have to go to the store so um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that this winter when it comes to planning what plants you're going to grow, but it's never too early to think about it. And so by all means, yes, add peppers to your garden, but consider adding a lot of other really good plants as well. Yeah, Chris, you're going to try popcorn next year. Absolutely. In fact, um, You've probably seen my recent videos with that newer bed where I'm growing tomatoes uh, under hoops and I have some green beans under the A-frame trellis. In that bed next year, it's all going to be popcorn. So again, you, you can never plan too soon for your garden. So next year, I'm going to be growing popcorn in that bed. I'll be doing a video similar to this last garlic video. Um, it won't be released for a long while but I'm going to show the entire process from putting the seed in the ground to growing the popcorn to harvesting the popcorn to popping the popcorn so good for you um, I'll be doing that along with you next year and I already know exactly what bed that popcorn is going to be growing in and then I'll be saving some of that seed to grow again the following year and just keep doing that year in and year out so 
Um, great, great idea. I'm glad we're thinking alike. Great gardening minds think alike. Hope you had, have good success next year with your popcorn. Okay, um, Janan is asking, what is everyone's favorite paste tomato? Um, and I, I hope you get lots of people responding. San Marzano, <coughs> excuse me, San Marzano is my favorite, um, but there's lots of, of good ones out there. Roma is the most common one, um, but if you grow paste tomatoes, go ahead and share that with John Ann um, because I'd be interested as well to see what people are having success with in the way of um, uh, that. Okay, uh, let's see. Chris is asking, what kind of popcorn are you growing? Um, I'm planning on a um, red popcorn. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but it's it's red, and so I want to grow it for my grandkids to see red popcorn kernels, but then it pops into a pretty good size white popcorn. Um, can't think of it off the top of my head, but when you do a search for your seed, you'll see that there's lots of different types out there. And whatever that red one is that has a medium size um, pop, uh, that's the one I'm growing. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rachel is also saying San Marzano. Laurelful saying San Marzano. Um, keep up up to max. Oh, I don't know that one, Heidi. Um, and um, Amish paste. Um, that's another good suggestion. So um, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And thank you for those of you that are throwing out your favorites. Um, there's some I haven't grown before that I may just have to add to my mix, my mix for next year. Thanks. Um, that's a great idea. PD is saying, Gardner Scott, um, 20 pounds of tomatoes yesterday. My wife made marinara sauce last night and salsa just now. All herbs from the garden. Life is good. Outstanding. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Growing everything you need to do it all yourself. Outstanding. Thanks, PD. I appreciate you sharing that because that's exactly what um, what I'm talking about. Glad to hear it. Thanks so much. Um, strawberry popcorn. There you go, Jeff. Yeah, I think that's what it's called that I'll be growing. Strawberry popcorn. Uh, I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, okay, let's get to a little philosophy point right now. And, and I've been talking around this subject um, throughout the discussion today. But the idea is now that you're getting, um, for many of us, at the end of our growing season, and especially for those of you in Australia and New Zealand and the other part of the world, as you're getting ready for your season, really start to focus on successes. And, and I say this often, we're, we're going to have the things that go wrong in our garden and we should focus on the successes. And I usually refer to it in, as a plural, um, that we focus on all of the things that went right to help overcome that sense of loss because of the things that went wrong. But today, I want you to think about one particular success because it's really easy to look at your garden and say, oh, I just harvested 20 pounds of tomatoes and made a great marinara sauce. Uh, or you look at all the other things that are happening in your garden. Oh, I've had so much zucchini that I've shared 20 pounds with my neighbors. Or the herbs are doing great. Or whatever. You have so many things that might be going well in your garden that you just look at all of it and say, this was a good gardening year. I had a really good harvest this year. And you group everything together. But if you really try to focus on one success, you're more likely to replicate that success. Because I know that I have this issue, even with garden journals. I'll look at the season and go, wow, this was great. That was great. All these other things were great. The bugs weren't that bad. I had a lot of birds in the garden. Didn't even see a single caterpillar. Oh, it was all so wonderful. And then the next season starts and you plan your beds, you plan your seeds, you plan your growing, and you kind of go into the next season thinking, wow, that last season was really good. I hope this one is as good. Or 
Man, I had a terrible last year. I hope this one is better. And that's how we often approach our gardening season, is with a generality. Last year was good or last year was bad. This year, I hope is good or I hope is better. But if you can focus on a specific success, what worked really well this year? Why was this year a success? Or if this year was bad, what one thing stood out as being the only thing that went well? If you can focus on that one thing, then you can replicate it. And so next year, you do that one thing for sure. And you know that at least that one thing will probably be another success next year. And so the reason I throw this out at you, especially for you new gardeners, if you can focus on that one thing that is working well, well, think about it. I've been gardening for about 30 years. And so if I had done this over the course of 30 years, now going into next season, I would be doing 30 things that I know will work in my garden, that I know will be a success. If you're just starting out and this is your first year, and I know I have a lot of first year gardeners that are watching my videos, do the one thing next year that you learned was the right thing to do this year. And then next year, do the same thing. Next year, pick that one thing that highlights itself as a, as a success. And then the following year, now you got two things to start with. And I didn't do this for most of my gardening career. And my journey has been up and down and up and down with the successes and with the failures. But about five years ago, maybe six years ago, I really started doing this in earnest. I really started to try to highlight what works best for me. So that's why when I do a video that's the best tomato trellis, that's because that's the best trellis that I have found for me. And that's why I continue to use that type of trellis for tomatoes. When I do a video on the best way to transplant tomatoes, it's because I found something that works and I continue to do that. This year, what worked for me and just really stood out as something that I've never really done before, but I'm going to do much more of in the future, is covering my plants with a row cover fabric in summer, going into the fall. And I, I talk about this in a couple recent videos, but I'll use row cover coverings in the spring to protect my plants, to help raise the temperature a little bit, but mostly to keep the pests, the insect pests away from my plants. And also to help keep some of the animal pests away from my plants. But I never really did much of it in the summer going into the fall. Well, I've got a bunch of videos now talking about fall gardening. And fall gardening is basically just spring gardening, but later in the year. And so I really stopped and thought, why haven't I been doing this? Why would I cover the plants in the spring and not cover them in the summer for the same reasons? And the bed that I've got that row cover over, oh, I've been enjoying lettuce and spinach and kale that are already growing to the point of harvest. And I just started it about a month ago. And what's so incredible is the lettuce and the spinach and the kale have zero insect damage. It's so wonderful to harvest a head of lettuce and there's no holes in it. The, the tips aren't chewed off because a pest couldn't get through that row fabric, row cover fabric to get to the plants. So for me, this was a shining moment of success in my garden that I'm sharing with you. Hopefully you'll consider that idea in the future. But for me, absolutely. Next year, when I put my seeds in for my fall garden, I'm going to put the hoops over. I'm going to put a row fabric over it. And I can expect that the plants are going to germinate without any issue of pest damage. 
uh, and it also helps minimize a lot of those other concerns that you might have in your garden as far as too much sun and helping to keep the the soil from um, the soil moisture evaporating all of all of that takes place when you have a cover over your plants so uh, what did you do what was your singular success this year what was the one thing that really stood out and if you can identify that then carry it forward next year and i talk in terms of a success what was your one success well if you just had a terrible year if everything was devastated by a hurricane or a tornado or some weather event or pest event or animal event and everything was devastated well you can also use that in the same way what was the one thing when you look back on your garden and say man nothing grew it was terrible what was the one thing that maybe you could have done to prevent that from happening or maybe make it so it wouldn't have been as bad so same idea focus on one thing the success or the one thing you could have done differently and now next year as you enter into your garden season use that to your advantage and so if you're just now entering into spring in Australia what one thing can you do this year that you haven't thought about that you're going to add to your gardening mix so that you can ensure you're going to have a successful season the rest of us that are growing actively right now go out to your garden stand in it look around inspect the plants inspect every aspect of your garden so you can start highlighting some of these successes and be able to repeat it in the future now i'm not guaranteeing that next year you'll have the exact same success as you did this year but you're more likely to have success if you repeat something that you know works in your garden and that way you don't have to listen to gardeners like me and you don't have to listen to all those other people giving you advice because you will know what works in your garden and that's the best way to success that's the best way to become a better gardener is to recognize what is working best in your garden whatever it happens to be and that's why i mix up so many of these different gardening methods because a little from that one and a little bit from this other one works best in my garden and and i have diversity in my garden as a result of it and it all started by highlighting those single things that i was able to realize yeah this works best for me it might not work best for you but i know it works best for me so i'm going to keep doing it and of course i'm going to keep sharing with you those things that i know work and i'll keep sharing with you the highlights that i have in my garden so hopefully you can learn from them as well even if you haven't done it and tried it and hopefully we will all continue on our paths to become better gardeners and that brings us to at the end of our time so i appreciate you joining me on monday i hope i see you next monday keep the questions coming keep watching the videos you can watch this in replay if you missed the beginning of it and I do appreciate you and all that you give me because I love you being here and I love sharing this time. So thank you so much. Until I see you next Monday, I'm Gardener Scott and enjoy gardening.